participation. Mevrem sopliyo mişem dek. Ormutsta kütüzlüs gelme babası. Ağmur savlut Germaniya komünist bir ismiyeri ko okupire bulu. For 45 years after World War II, East Germany was occupied by the communists. The Soviet troops stationed about half a million soldiers in the territory. Moscow began withdrawing the troops from Germany only after the collapse of the socialist system and was completed in 1994. Germany had paid $9 billion for the invaders to conclude the withdrawal comfortably. However, not all Russians withdrew from the country. Now, their interests are protected by a bronze soldier. There are three memorials for Russian soldiers in Berlin. According to the agreement on troop withdrawal, which was signed in 1990, Germany is charged with maintaining them. The first memorial was opened November 11, 1945, a few dozen meters from the Reichstag, in Tigartensk Park. Here is the bronze sculpture of an eight-meter-tall soldier. During the Cold War between the Soviet Union and the West, there were many pockets of resistance. But Berlin held a special place among them. Located in the heart of Europe, the city was an accurate barometer of the Cold War. The German Tragedy The Second World War ended in disaster for Germany. The 12 year reign of the Nazis plunged the country into a dire situation. Hitler promised the Germans to return lost territory, to restore pride, resuscitate the empire, and dominate the world. Instead, the Germans got a new war, millions dead, famine, and destruction. In the first half of the 20th century, Germany lost two world wars. At the end of April 1945, the Soviet army took Berlin. Germany unconditionally surrendered to the Allies. The victorious heads of state met at the Potsdam Conference to decide the fate of defeated Germany, July 17, 1945. This conference was attended by U.S. President Harry Truman, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, and Soviet leader Joseph Stalin. The conference decided to fully demilitarize Germany. Germany was banned from building war materials, and the Nazi party was outlawed. Germany lost considerable territory. The city of Konigsberg and part of East Prussia were transferred to the Soviet Union. Lithuania got the city of Memel. Germany's border with Poland moved to the oder neisse line. Poland gained almost half of East Prussia. The Saar region became a French protectorate. In total, the Third Reich lost 25% of its territory. The Allies divided the rest of Germany into four occupation zones. American, French, English, and Soviet sections were divided, as well as the capital, Berlin. Poland took Silesia, East Brandenburg, and East Prussia. Poland 
The Soviet Union gave Poland this territory as compensation because it had lost much of its land in the 1939 agreement between Hitler and Stalin. Stalin did not want to return these territories, and therefore Germany's loss was Poland's gain. According to the decision of the conference, each country independently managed their respective occupation zones. In addition, a supervisory board was established to coordinate common issues in Berlin with the participation of all four allied countries. To compensate for the damage caused by the war, the allies were going to receive reparations from the corresponding zone under their direction. The Soviet Union was most active in this regard. Trains loaded with supplies left from Germany to Russia daily. Russians regarded the occupation zone as an economic area where they were to receive compensation. They took almost everything from there in compensation for the damage caused by Germany during the war. In general, they exported industrial facilities. They dismantled more than a thousand companies and sent them to Russia. German soldiers began hosting allies. The population, left homeless and without food and basic conditions, fell victim to looters. The most difficult situation was in the Soviet occupation sector, where violence, abuse and rape became common. Because of the terror that the Nazis staged on Soviet territory, the Red Army took revenge on Germans 100-fold. Externally, the Allies were in complete agreement. In Berlin, demonstration parades were held and the control boards were making joint decisions. But they were, in fact, divided. The West was increasingly dissatisfied with the Soviet Union's creeping influence in the world. After the war, Poland, Romania and Bulgaria adopted pro-Soviet regimes. Yugoslavia, Albania and Czechoslovakia were in nearly the same situation, where communists had a huge impact with the support of the Kremlin. Soviet troops were in Austria and East Germany. The Soviet Union tried to establish control in Greece, where it aided a guerrilla movement. The Kremlin exercised pressure on Turkey, where Moscow hoped to seize the Bosphorus and Dardanelles Straits. And the the Soviet Union made it clear to the West that this area is a sphere of influence for the Soviets. It was Poland, the Baltic states, Romania, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia. Although it should be noted that the formation of the Soviet regime in Czechoslovakia began in 1948. It had no communist government before. So, in 1948, we got a communist border that divided Europe into two parts. The Soviet Union gained dominance over much of Eastern and Central Europe. The devastated post-war continent provided a convenient backdrop for communist propaganda. In addition to the countries of the East, the countries of Central and Western Europe were threatened by Sovietization. In France and Italy, the communists were even represented in the government. On the streets of Rome and Paris, leftists organized mass actions. Europe was truly under the threat of becoming red.
In a speech on March 6, 1946, at Fulton College, Winston Churchill declared that the Soviet Union was creating a totalitarian system in Eastern Europe. From Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the continent. Behind that line lie all the capitals. Churchill said Moscow had divided Europe with an iron curtain. He urged the West to rise up against the limitations on freedom and democracy. Following the presentation, it became clear that the Cold War had begun. One year after Churchill's speech, on March 12, 1947, President Truman presented a new foreign policy doctrine to the U.S. Congress. The free peoples of the world look to us for support in maintaining their freedoms. If we falter in our leadership, we may endanger the peace of the world. Its purpose was to stop the spread of communism in the world. This policy meant that the White House would assist any country threatened by communism. America began to develop a special economic program. According to the calculations of the White House, improving living standards in Europe weakened the communist influence there. The program was entrusted to Secretary of State George Marshall. The U.S. contributed $13 billion to 16 European countries. The four-year program began April 1948. The White House also suggested that the Soviet Union participate in the Marshall Plan. Despite the fact that the countries of the Soviet bloc were in dire economic crisis, Moscow flatly refused to accept aid from the capitalists. The Americans suggested that all of Europe participate in the Marshall Plan, which provided funding to rebuild countries. The Soviet Union regarded the proposal as interference in its economic political system. It gave up this plan and forbade its satellite states from participating in the project. The Marshall Plan was the main, but not the only factor in rebuilding Europe. The clash between the West and the Soviet Union became clear as the Marshall Plan was implemented. It manifested itself most clearly in Germany. The situation between the Allies was so intense that the Control Council in Berlin stopped working. Berlin was split in two. Between East and West, relations were strained. Both sides pursued their own interests. But these interests were different from each other, so it was not possible to reach an agreement. Die Interessen waren unterschiedlich. Die Sowjetunion wollte europäische Hegemonie. The Soviet Union wanted hegemony in Europe and to spread its influence over the largest possible area. At that time, the Soviet Union insisted upon unifying Germany, then establishing its control over the rest of the country. In January 1948, Western countries began consulting with the German government over the occupation zones. This greatly irritated Moscow. Stalin's response came quickly. If the West will own Germany, we will create our own Germany, the leader said. Despite Moscow's reaction, an international conference about Germany was held in London that March. 
it was decided to create a federal German Republic in the Western Zone, and a constituent assembly was authorized to draft a new constitution. It became clear that the formation of a new German state was only a matter of time. Und 1948 ist ein Schlüsseljahr. 1948 was a turning point, because in this year, Western countries decided that they would establish a democratic state in their zones. They hoped to soon add the Soviet zone in the east to it. The London Conference was held, where it was decided to form the Federal Republic of Germany. Currency reform also took effect, but touched only the Western Zones and West Berlin. To start a direct confrontation, Moscow needed only a pretext. In the summer of 1948, America, Britain, and France joined the western occupation zones of Germany and began to revive its economy. On June 20th, instead of the old Reich bills, the new German mark went into circulation in West Germany and West Berlin. In response, Stalin ordered a complete blockade of West Berlin. On June 24, 1948, the Soviet Union began a blockade of Berlin. It was the first open confrontation between Moscow and the West. West Berlin, which was controlled by the Allies, was cut off from Soviet electricity and drinking water, and road and rail traffic were also blocked. More than two million residents of West Berlin were cut off from the outside world. Contact with the city was only possible by air. Two days after the announcement of the blockade, the American Air Force began supplying vital goods. U.S. airplanes were landing every five minutes at Berlin's Tempelhof Airport. For 11 months, more than 300 aircraft landed at the airport, supplying Berliners with food, water, medicine, fuel, clothing, and other necessities. The currency reform was merely a pretext. The Soviet Union wanted to avoid or at least slow down the creation of a new German state. Moscow assumed that the West would be unable to withstand such pressure and would leave Berlin. But the Kremlin's calculations were not justified. The first to use aircraft to break the blockade was the head of the American occupation zone, General Lucius Clay. This was the only route that the Kremlin wouldn't dare to block. You can stop traffic on the land, but in the air, the only way to stop them was to shoot down the planes. This would mean an inevitable military confrontation, to which the Kremlin was not yet ready. In West Berlin, electricity was switched off. Production was halted. Shops were closed. The city had enough supplies for 36 days and fuel would have run out in 45 days. According to specialists, in order to avoid starvation, 1,500 tons of food and 2,500 tons of fuel had to be airlifted to the city daily. A strict timetable was observed at Tempelhof. Planes unloaded in seven minutes and were on the ground for only half an hour. Supplying Berlin by air was very difficult, but the Allies organized it somehow. 
aircraft brought and even disassembled hospitals, power plants, and then they were collected on the spot to eliminate power shortages in the city. West Berlin was lucky because the Tempelhof airport, which was one of the biggest in the world, was located in the western sector. Otherwise, supplying the city by air would have been impossible. Das ist Zufall. Das war der größte Flughafen der Welt. Der stand dort, ein riesiges Areal. Most of all, children were happy at the sight of American planes. American pilots dropped chocolate candies over Berlin with small parachutes. On September 9, 1948, locals held a protest against the blockade. Residents of the city turned to the world for help. Ihr Völker in Amerika, in England, in Frankreich, in Italien, schaut auf diese Stadt. After the rally, a peaceful demonstration went to East Berlin at the Brandenburg Gate, but the Soviet military opened fire on them. The most difficult period for the city came in winter, because many flights were cancelled due to bad weather. To heat their homes, people cut down trees along the streets, and food quality plummeted. But, despite everything, people did not break the blockade. Berliners didn't want to even consider living under the Soviets. the Kremlin missed its target. On May 14, 1949, the Soviet Union and the U.S. came to an agreement ending the Berlin blockade, which lasted 343 days. And the result was that the result of the blockade was that America, Britain, and France, who had all been Germany's enemies, suddenly became its friends. Before the blockade, the Allies perceived the population of Berlin as hostile, that they were in conquered land, and all Germans were Nazis. In any case, such charges could be heard quite often. Occupying forces were forbidden from making friends with the local residents. But during the blockade, the Americans were already great friends. Russia achieved the opposite of its goals. The Westerners were the defenders of Berliners, while the Russians, on the contrary, organized the blockade. After the blockade, two German states were formed. In May 1949, work was completed on the Constitution of West Germany. On May 23rd, Constitutional Council head Konrad Adenauer announced the creation of the Federal Republic of Germany. In September that year, the newly elected Bundestag officially confirmed the formation of the new Germany as a state. Konrad Adenauer was elected federal chancellor and a representative of the Christian Democratic Union. In response, the Soviet Union created its own Germany in the East. This monumental building, which stands in Berlin at the crossroads of the Leipzigstrasse and Wilhelmstrasse, was the residence of one of the most influential people in Nazi Germany, Hermann Goering. This was the air ministry of the Third Reich. The building was built so strongly that it survived the intense bombing of the city in 1945. It, in addition to the Nazis, were directly connected to the building of the German Democratic Republic, or the GDR. 
In May 1949, in territory controlled by the Allies, the Federal Republic of Germany was formed. The Communists did not hesitate to respond. On October 7th of that year, in the auditorium of this building, the People's Council of Germany met and announced the establishment of a second Germany. The new state consisted of six German lands, with a population of 17 million people. The first president of the GDR was Wilhelm Pieck. However, in East Germany, the president had only a symbolic purpose. In reality, the country was ruled by the Unified Socialist Party of pro-Soviet Germany, led by Walter Ubricht. Die teilweise Übereignung von During the reign of the Nazis, Ubricht was in exile in the Soviet Union and was considered Stalin's brightest pupil. Despite the fact that Ubricht was never the head of the country, power was handed over to him. The Prime Minister was Otto Grotewoch and the President Wilhelm Pieck. But the most powerful figure in the German Democratic Republic was Walter Ubricht. Aber der mächtigste Mann im Osten in der, in der DDR war eben Walter Ulbricht. Die Sowjetunion sehr schnell eine Parteidiktatur errichtete und die Sozialdemokraten. The Soviet Union very quickly created a party dictatorship in the East German system. Since competing with the Social Democrats was difficult, they were forced to unite with the communists. As a result, there was a United Socialist Party of Germany, which was ruled by the communists. The Soviets brought the so-called Ubricht group to Germany. There were communists who lived in the Soviet Union during the Nazi reign in Germany. Their headquarters were located in a Moscow hotel suite. Socialism began to be assembled in Germany. Ulbricht, who was an ideological Stalinist, introduced the Soviet model to the country. Businesses were nationalized, and private sector activity was limited. The development of heavy industry was named as a priority. As a result of decreased production of consumer goods, light and food industries, lines formed at grocery stores. People could not buy products, only tickets. 11% of the East German budget was spent on defense while another 20% was sent to pay reparations to the Soviet Union. The country was on the verge of starvation. The situation in the other part of the city was radically different. In December 1949, the Marshall Plan was introduced in the Federal Republic of Germany. America contributed $4.4 billion to aid in Germany's recovery. With this aid, West Germany became one of the most developed European countries in short order. The radical difference in living standards caused the population to flee the East. In 1952 alone, 180,000 citizens escaped from the GDR to West Germany. Citizens of the German Democratic Republic who escaped from the eastern sector to the western sector of Berlin were placed in camps. They were interrogated by American and British security officials, then released. As a rule, they then left West Berlin. They were transported by air to West Germany. At first, East Berlin was losing 400 to 500 citizens a month, but their number continued to grow and reached the thousands. 
In early 1953, living in East Germany grew even harder. In April, prices increased on public transport, clothing, and food. In May of that year, the Ubricht government increased production quotas by 10%. This decision led to massive protests in the GDR. A centralized economy, a working standard, and a plan for running businesses were established. Over time, the expectations were raised, but the salary remained the same. Labor also increased on Stalin's wall, provoking the workers to strike. Initially, the strike was directed against the high standards and not the system. But when workers staged a demonstration and went to the House of Government, they were joined by the public. So the strike turned into a rebellion against the regime. On June 15th, a strike began that soon gripped all of East Germany. Thousands demonstrated in the capital and other major cities. Along with social and economic demands came political ones. People gathered in the street to demand the removal of communist rule and the unification of Germany. Two days later, on June 17th, 1953, here at Leipzig Strasse, the communist occupation regime sent tanks. Russian tanks appeared in the city by noon. By this time, the protesters had occupied the headquarters of the party and security services. Left on the street, people were destroying boundary markers, police departments. The population destroyed Soviet symbols and burned red flags. The rallies frightened the leadership of the German Democratic Republic so much that they no longer knew what to do. They were in a panic, so much so that the head of the Soviet occupation forces shut them in one room under house arrest so that they could not do anything stupid. After that, the Soviet command said, we'll deal with the demonstrators. And Soviet tanks crushed the uprising. They were only able to stop the protests with military force. At 1 p.m., the command of Soviet East Berlin declared a state of emergency. Armored vehicles seized Potsdam Square and tried to disperse the demonstrators. Unarmed Germans threw stones at the tanks. Throughout the day, it was reported that a state of emergency was declared and no one could be found in the streets. We lived in the area on the outskirts of the city. Suddenly, we heard an incredible noise. Cars, tanks, that were 45 minutes away, drove to Berlin from all sides. They were T-134s. I can never forget that hum. I've seen it all with my own eyes. The roar that was such that it shook the earth. To forget this is impossible. One hundred twenty-five people were killed in clashes with the Soviet army, and up to one thousand were wounded. In addition to Berlin, 
riots swept Dresden, Magdeburg, and Gorlitz. After the demonstrations were suppressed, GDR Radio issued a statement saying that with the help of the Soviet army and the police, an anti-national uprising was suppressed, arranged and mishandled from West Berlin by provocateurs and thugs. On June 17th, strikes and demonstrations took place in about 700 towns and cities in the German Democratic Republic. These protests involved not only workers, but also representatives of all segments of the population. The uprising was directed against the Soviet occupation regime. Germany's population was united. The uprising was crushed by Soviet tanks, but it happened with the consent of the leadership of the German Democratic Republic, and probably at its request. By the end of the 1950s, the processes of integrating the Federal Republic of Germany with the West was finally complete. In May 1952 in Bonn, the Allies and Germany formalized an agreement under which the occupation regime was lifted. The Federal Republic of Germany was given complete freedom in the conduct of its international and domestic affairs. Despite the fact that Germany's territorial integrity was violated and the Saarland was still a protectorate of France, in May 1955 it was accepted into the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. West Germany became the 16th member of NATO. In response to the entry of Germany into the alliance, the Soviet Union created a military bloc the same year. The socialist countries signed an agreement in Warsaw. In 1955, the world aligned itself into opposing poles, with the dividing line running across the heart of Europe in Berlin. The West had the advantage over the Kremlin. In Berlin, it had an important staging area. Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev compared West Berlin to a bone stuck in the throat of socialism. He was convinced that the West led intelligence activities against the Soviet Union from Berlin. Khrushchev's main goal was international recognition for the GDR, the capital of which would be in United Berlin. In November 1958, Khrushchev declared that the Soviet Union intended to abolish the international status of Berlin. He urged Western countries to abandon the occupation zones and to recognize Berlin as a free city. If this plan were implemented over time, West Berlin would be sure to go red. And if the Allies did not accept the Kremlin's offer, the Soviet Union would unilaterally make out a settlement agreement with the GDR and would have handed over the occupation function to East Germany. In addition, East Germany established control over all transportation corridors that connected the Federal Republic of Germany with East Berlin. And, um West Berlin was never the capital of the German Democratic Republic. The authorities of the GDR and the Soviets wanted it to be so. But under international law, such was not the case. They were always writing in large letters, Berlin, capital of the German Democratic Republic. But it didn't change anything. In a statement, Khrushchev declared that any provocation against the GDR would be perceived as a direct attack against the Soviet Union. 
Shortly after this declaration, Moscow issued an official note to former allies and gave them six months to leave Berlin. But America was not going to concede. The White House said it intended to protect its interests in West Berlin and was ready, if necessary, to use force. As a display of its commitment, in May 1959, the U.S. even deployed tactical nuclear weapons to Berlin. Negotiations over Berlin dragged on for three years between the Soviet Union and the United States. The last meeting between Khrushchev and President John F. Kennedy took place in the Austrian capital, June 1961. The parties failed to reach a compromise. Khrushchev tried to intimidate the American president, and Kennedy tied the issue of Berlin with the vital interests of the United States and was not going to make any concessions. President Kennedy, hatte president Kennedy very clearly stated the position of the United States. Allied military units were not going to leave West Berlin. Transport highways between West Berlin and West Germany had to be guaranteed as well. The right of West Berliners to self-determination was also of vital importance. These were the three main points of American policy. In other words, the Americans did not plan to start a war in 1961. Having determined these points, Kennedy made it clear to Russia, we leave you to your area of influence. In Berlin, the situation was getting worse. People ran away from socialism. In the first half of 1961, 207,000 people from the GDR fled to West Berlin. 30,000 people escaped to West Germany alone, most of them young qualified professionals. Berlin's open borders contributed to the mass migration. Every day, about 300,000 people moved from one part of the city to another and vice versa. In East Berlin, citizens were working in the West. Residents of the West often studied in the East, etc. This is just for me not easy to really remember what I did in the East. I often crossed into West Berlin with my classmates. The Western part was only a 15-minute walk from our school. After the Janowitz Bridge was a cinema, and we went there almost every day and stayed with friends in West Berlin. I was little then, but noticed that compared to the Eastern part, the standard of living there was quite high. Und es war ständig so die Frage, und man hat bis 1961 dann schon gemerkt, dass im Westen... Everyone knew that West Berlin was developing rapidly, and there was a high standard of living. The Marshall Plan was an economic miracle. There they had more beautiful cars, nice clothes were sold in shops, there were no shortages. For residents of East Berlin, it was a very great temptation. They could see the difference. If they were lucky, they tried to work in the West. There, they received Western money, which they then traded on the black market. In early August 1961, Soviet bloc heads of state met in Moscow. To stop the mass migration, German socialist leader Walter Ubricht proposed isolating West Berlin. Moscow agreed. On August 13, 1961, workers began building the separation wall in Berlin. In one night, the soldiers blocked 193 streets with barbed wire, closed four subway lines and eight tram lines. 
They welded shut gas and water pipes. The telephone link between East and West Berlin was broken, along with electrical lines. This wall divided city streets, squares, bridges, cemeteries, and families. Often, the border ran right through houses. For example, on Bernauerstrasse, the sidewalk was in West Berlin, and the house in East Berlin. The wall was erected on the sidewalk in a building and also sealed the front door and windows from the street that went to West Berlin. The communists built a four-meter-high concrete wall, almost 106 kilometers. In the morning, Berliners awoke divided. The People's Army of Germany had mobilized at the border with West Berlin and the Brandenburg Gate. The soldiers did not miss anyone. They answered the population's protests with gas. No teacher was left at a school in East Berlin. The postman could not deliver letters to West Berlin. Patients were unable to go to the doctor. Newlyweds, on the eve of signing on the western part, were not allowed to go see their parents. I remember in first grade we had a favorite teacher. After the summer holidays, when the wall was erected, she did not appear at school. With the new school year always raised the question, which of my classmates or teachers won't be with us anymore? The previous night before the erection of the walls, some of the residents were in West Berlin at the cinema or a club. At that time, people actively went to West Berlin. In the morning, it was found that the wall was built, and it was impossible to return home. At the Brandenburg Gate stood the soldiers of the People's Army of East Germany, which did not allow the people to pass. After nearly a month, almost all the barbed wire was replaced with concrete walls. The communist authorities tried to block any exit. Barbed wire was strung along the windows and the top of each wall. The border perimeter was controlled by 302 watchtowers. But despite this, people still managed to escape. The wall defined our way of life, because it existed, we had great limitations. Almost all of our relatives lived on the other side, in the western sector, relatives of my father, my mother's relatives. It was very difficult to meet them. This situation led to a locked sense of rejection from society. Most of the cases of escape occurred in the early years, when the wall was not yet built. People passed right through the barbed wire, or jumped from upper floors. One German soldier fled to the west, leaving his post and throwing his weapons. When the wall was built, 200 people were killed trying to cross, with as many wounded and 3,000 arrested. The GDR security service supervised the whole operation of building the wall as well as the follow-up. They created a whole infrastructure from the wall.
the Secret Service of East Germany, which is abbreviated Stasi, was founded in 1950 as a copy of the Soviet KGB. The Stasi controlled almost all aspects of Eastern Germany. Officially, there were 90,000 employees in its ranks, but it employed 200,000 secret agents. This meant that every fifth citizen was associated with the secret services. Almost no one knew what intelligence chief Marcus Wolf looked like. Because of this, the people called him the man without a face. East Germany's secret service was almost directly subordinated to the Soviet KGB. Agents from Moscow enjoyed the same status and rights in the GDR as the Soviet Union. The KGB had its office at the Ministry of State Security in East Germany. In Dresden, under the roof of the Soviet consulate, future Russian President Vladimir Putin served with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. The DDR had then the thesis aufgestellt, that it was an anti-imperialist defense. The leaders of the German Democratic Republic said that the wall was a barrier that protected against the imperialists. However, looking at the construction of the wall, you realize that it was not so. It was not built to stop the West's tanks. Otherwise, they would have to dig anti-tank trenches and arrange many other fortifications. The wall itself confirmed that the communists built it to stop their own people from running away. The Berlin subway is one of the oldest in Europe. Its first station was built in the early 20th century. As in other cities, the Berlin subway had one sole purpose, to carry passengers. However, in 1961 it acquired the additional function of the underground border crossing. After the wall was built, the subway was divided into two parts. There were ghost stations. That's what people called the 15 stations where the train didn't stop. The only exception was the Friedrichstrasse station, which was set up as a checkpoint. At this station, communists were given visas to travel to East Berlin. The construction of the wall brought the Soviet Union and the West to the brink of war. On August 16th, the U.S. government brought the National Guard and reservists to full combat readiness. The Allies in West Berlin sent additional troops. In response, the Soviet Union issued a note of protest, in which Moscow threatened to close the airspace of Berlin to the Allies and shoot down planes. In September, the U.S. increased its troops in West Germany by 40,000 soldiers and 300 strategic bombers. Military conflict between the two systems took a real shape. On October 17th, Khrushchev tried to calm down the situation. In Moscow, at the 21st Congress of the Communist Party, the Soviet leader said that if the West would show a real desire to settle the Berlin issue, there could be peace within the GDR. This statement meant a concession on the part of the Kremlin. Nonetheless, tensions did not subside in Berlin. At the end of October 1961, a conflict at a checkpoint nearly caused the outbreak of war. The checkpoint the Americans called Charlie opened on Friedrichstrasse September 22, 1961, after the communists began building the Berlin Wall. It mostly processed Allied military units going to East Berlin on official business. 
A month after the opening, East Berlin border guards violated the existing treaty and refused to allow an American officer to pass. Tensions between the Soviet Union and the West had been great, but after this incident, the confrontation between the two systems reached a peak. On October 28, in 1961, Russian and American tanks were at Checkpoint Charlie in full combat readiness. They awaited their orders. The distance between them was not more than 100 meters. The planet was one shot away from World War III. Russian armored vehicles at the checkpoint took combat positions. American and Soviet tanks stood face to face throughout the night. In the morning, Moscow issued an order to leave the position and halt the confrontation. Soviet equipment returned to its depot. 20 minutes later, U.S. forces left the checkpoint. World War III was avoided. In September 1971, the Soviet Union, the U.S., France, and Great Britain signed a quadripartite agreement which finally determined the status of West Berlin. The Federal Republic of Germany had the authority to represent West Berlin at the international level. But at the same time, Berlin was not a part of it. The same contract settled the transit traffic between Berlin and West Germany. A year after this agreement, East and West Germany formally recognized each other. In 1990, Germany was reunited, and the wall that separated it was destroyed. Despite this, in the minds of the Germans, it has remained. The difference between East and West Germany is felt even today. The 45-year Soviet occupation has left a deep mark in the Germans. First of all, we should admit, and I have said this before, that the fall of the Soviet Union was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the century.